it is getting more obvious as we look at the world as we consider the things that are happening in the world that the world's going to hell in a handbasket literally it's choosing to do things that seem right in their own eyes lots of people in their own personal understanding often do that they look at something and they say huh I think I'll call that a rose well it's already been named it's not a rose I just don't know what it's called <laughs> my wife does so I always ask her I always call her you know those carnation looking things and they're not carnations but you see a rose by any other name would not be a rose and so calling it something that it's not doesn't change the nature of what it is that's true about the world and its ways the world can't help but do what it's doing it can't help but fall into patterns of behavior that are natural and normal for them to do what we choose not to do the world is a violent place violence is on the increase you don't see it decreasing at all as a matter of fact you see children learning the way of violence and the way of war they think that somehow Christianity can be exemplified by being a good soldier for God killing in the name of God now that's been done before and it's been tried and unfortunately unless you are led by the Spirit of God you won't know the difference between those that are claiming to be Christian and killing because they're working in the flesh than those who are Christians that may be in the military through some choices that they've made but God doesn't want them to kill or to die by the sword because everywhere that you go no matter what you do God has put you someplace to do something to accomplish his will to be done it may be a strange journey you're on you may be in some unpredictable places that most people would say to you no a Christian would not do that I can't say that to you you see I've been in some unusual places that I know God was with me and God let me go there and some places even God took me there so in your life I don't know what God may do with you but you may go through some struggle spiritually to find the faith that you know you have but somehow you've gone astray in some way the only way that you can ever be sure of that is to keep reading the word keep praying keep talking to God keep finding out what it is that you can cling to in your faith simplify it so that you're boiling it down to a personal relationship with God alone that you have that first and foremost in your life so that nothing else can come in between it not wife not house not car not children not church not whatever it may be it comes between you and your personal relationship with God because the testing will come the trials will come the tribulations will be there you will be tested just like Abraham was to find out whether or not you love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength or you love something else first it's a trying of your faith true but it's also a test for you to find out will you follow Jesus to the ends of the earth or are you really just going along with the crowd streams in the desert is often one that I read whenever I'm struggling in my own personal walk in my faith when I need some encouragement or I need some counseling God always speaks to me through the word in streams in the desert consider the work of God for who can make that straight which he has made crooked? Ecclesiastes 7.13 You know, I am dumbfounded whenever I think about that itself. Who can make straight that which God has made crooked? Most people would say, well, God doesn't make things crooked. He makes them straight. And yet Ecclesiastes says, who can make straight that which God has made crooked? You see, that brings us to that perfect understanding that we don't know God's ways. That our thoughts are not his thoughts, neither are his ways our ways. Because we would, of course, make a straight way. We don't go out and make things crooked that, you know, we just choose to say, okay, you know, I think we'll mess this up. But God may have had a purpose and a design for making something crooked that, you know, he wants that way 
And that's why sometimes God will lead you in ways that you might not be able to explain to others or you may not even be able to explain to yourself. But you just fall on your knees and maybe your face and say, Huh, God, help me. Lead me not into temptation and deliver me from evil, but thy will be done, not mine. It is a challenge because the world, like I said, and its ways, is coming to an end. The deceptions and the doctrines and all the mishmash of confusion is going to come at you in a very real way, in a very personal way, starting even today as they're beginning to choose some new leader in one of the first churches that was ever designed upon the earth. The very first church that God called into being now is selecting for itself a leader that probably will lead it into heresy and apostasy to become the false world religion system of the world that the false prophet will guide to make a deal with the Antichrist, the false leader of the world that will come upon the scene very soon. We see that happening today. And that means that the Spirit of God is pulling back. The Spirit of God is stepping away from those places where God said, hey, I made it crooked. You can't make it straight. You can't straighten out what God is already saying is going to happen at the end of the world. You can't stop the battle of the ghetto from happening. You can't stop the Word of God from coming true. You cannot quit God from His purpose and design when He has foreordained that it will happen according to His Word, His will, and His timing. That's the problem with what can God do with something that's crooked because in reality He's going to fulfill all that He's promised for His will to be done even as he said it would, so that you would know that he is the Lord our God and that we can trust him and his work as opposed to thinking that we can change his mind in some way. Often God seems to place his children in positions of profound difficulty, leading them into a wedge from which there is no escape. Contriving a situation which no human judgment would have permitted had it been previously consulted. The very cloud conducts them thither you may be thus involved in something like this at the very hour. I know for myself, one of the greatest challenges, the greatest perplexity of faith, one of the greatest complete contradictions of Christianity in my life happened in a very real way when I was in the Marine Corps. And it, it hurt. It changed me. I'm forever different because of it. Before I became saved, before I went to a concert and accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, before I was filled with His Spirit and spoken tongues and gifts and anointings and things that were phenomenal, I was in school at the time, high school, and I had seen all the John Wayne movies and read Leon Uris books, you know, and been oh so patriotic and it was during the Nam era and my my numbers were getting pretty high you know for when I was going to be drafted so me and a bunch of buddies you know we said hey we want to we want to fight for God you know we want well fight for God we want to fight for our country you know we want to wave our flag you know and do all these things and you know own guns and go out and shoot things you know and so coming from one of those types of towns you know and wanting to assert my manhood you know I signed up for the early sign up program in the Marine Corps, you know, that six months later I'd be shipped off to Balboa, uh, Balboa, would be shipped off to MCRD in San Diego. And I thought, great, the world is coming to my doorstep. I'm going to go to Vietnam and kill people, kill them Vietnamese, in the name of country and God. As a young man, it sounded appealing. As a person who had no religious background, it sounded wonderful. As someone who had no father figure, oh, I wanted to be like John Wayne, you know, because the only thing we had in those days was like, terrorism was the simple idea that they were hijacking airplanes, you know, and flying them to Hanoi or wherever it may be. Of course, you know, there was patriotism of the max. We set our flag salute and we pledged allegiance to the flag, the United States of America, because America, after all, was right, of course, in Vietnam. 
And so with my draft number coming so high, I saw that I wanted to join rather than be selected and maybe stuck in some army place or someplace else. So I signed up and I talked two of my buddies into it so that I would have this little promotion waiting for me. Well, as I got closer and the day was coming, I wasn't thinking about it, you know, and I went to a concert of a buddy of mine took me to and I got saved. Wow, all of a sudden things had changed. I forgot all about the Marine Corps. I knew that I was going, but you know, I didn't pay attention to it. Instead, I was saved. I was sharing Jesus. I was telling people I was a Jesus freak. I was running around doing all kinds of things. But you see, I had already signed up. I had already made a contract before I got saved to go into the Marine Corps. And so the day came, we spent quite some time, you know, with prayer and supplications and even being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and doing all kinds of neat little things that, you know, most people would have wanted to, still to this day, some of them want to have it happen to them because they've never had something miraculous happen to them. But I had all these miracles that happened. Here I am in the Marine Corps. Oh my God. And suddenly I'm having issues. I'm having diarrhea. I'm having explosive diarrhea. Some guy steals my gear. In those days, normal. You know, I see corruption going on. People buying their orders, you know, where they want to go. Oh, I don't want to go to Nam. I want to go over here. I want to go to, you know, El Toro. I want to go here. I want to go that. And Daddy started paying for where they were going to go. And I started seeing all these things of what the core was in Vietnam era. And it was rotten. So, as I was sitting there, Sergeant Morningstar, you know, was there talking to us. You know, we were like, oh boy. And then God... God, at that point in time, I could, you know, hear God speaking to me. And Sergeant Morningstar said, you need to go every Sunday to this Campus Crusade for Christ services so that you would accept Jesus, you know, and get saved, you know. And, and you know, he, he didn't say saved, but he said so you could, you know, get God, you know, basically. I think he said get God. And so, you know, it was wonderful having this drill instructor called Sergeant Morningstar, you know, and he would tell us these things, you know. And so Sundays came around, you know, I was so far behind, I didn't go. I didn't go Sunday, you know, to church like I should have, where Campus Crusade had these little mini, mini services going on. And instead, I was polishing my brass, what little I had of it, and my gear was a mess, you know, and I wasn't ready for really boot camp. And I was being crushed and beaten up and had so much anxiety. And I didn't go. And then that night, I remember a few days into it or weeks into it. Suddenly, you know, I'm Marge, Sergeant Morningstar. I'm sitting there and listening to everybody reading their letters, and he's telling us these stories, you know. And God makes me feel like I need to get up and leave. And I said, No, Lord, if I got up and leave, I'll go to jail. <laughs> and God said, No, you go. All of a sudden, I'm between a rock and a hard spot. What do I do? Do I do what God says? I'm sitting there in boot camp. I'm sitting there in the barracks. I'm sitting there with all the other guys, and I feel this compulsion to just lift me up and turn my head and I even turned my head and looked at the door and God said go and I wouldn't get up and I wouldn't go and there was no doubt no doubt about it God told me to go I didn't that night I had massive diarrhea again and blood I was losing weight that next day a new drill instructor showed up. Sergeant Morningstar was gone. New drill instructor fresh from Nam who wanted to train his grunts or his, and I won't say the word, into men so that they could be taken to Nam and become in his corps fighters, soldiers, people who would die for their country. And he was gung-ho. Oh, he was so gung-ho, he took us all stark naked into the bathrooms. And he said, I want you to swear allegiance to me. I want you to swear allegiance to this gun or a rifle. You know, difference between a rifle and a gun, you know. One is for pleasure, one is for fun. But the point was that he told us, I want you to swear allegiance to this rifle that you were going to kill the enemy. You were going to kill, kill, kill. And we stood there and said, gow, gow, gow. And we swore allegiance to the gun, to the rifle. We just did a gun is a different thing. That's why I keep remembering it. It was a book at one time and story. So we did. And we came out and we were, we were all woo -rah, you know, going out into the track, you know, and doing our laps and our, you know, PFTs and all the other things that we were supposed to do. And I'm running around, you know, and I'm throwing up and, you know, diarrhea and I get sent to sick call, you know, and sick bay and, you know, they bring me back, you know, and I'm trying to survive and 
getting sicker by the day. Sure enough, you know, I get dragged into the office. Poor Sergeant Morningstar, and he says, Stone, you just can't cut it in my court. He says, we're shipping you out. You just, uh, you know, and read me the riot act, you know, and I said, sir, I don't want to. I want to stay, blah, 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 blah. I said, sir, permission to speak, sir. No, you don't have nothing to say. So I said it anyways. Shot off my mouth about how I wanted to be a killer. I wanted to kill in the name of God and country or country or whatever. And, you know, one of the darkest hours and days of my life. And that wasn't the worst. They shipped me out. Nope, wasn't a Marine. Couldn't be handle it. They didn't want me there. They took me out. Of course, the truth is, God didn't want me there. Who could make straight that which God has made crooked? So God got me out of there into Balboa Naval Hospital where I slowly began to recover. And gradually they diagnosed me eventually with from regional entritis, ileoproctitis to Crohn's disease. And one day I was standing on a parapet getting ready to kill myself when um, finally God delivered me from that too. But the point is, is that God will take you through some very perplexing situations and circumstances to bring you to the place where he wants you to be. It took me not 40 years, but almost, because I've been a Christian a little over 38 years. And I'm just now really in ministry full time as much as God wants in our life to be all of his and none of ours. And yet, and yet, in every situation and circumstance from the moment I got saved, God used it and taught me as he might you. There is situations and circumstances that nobody else will understand what you went through or how you went through it or why you went through it. But God will take you through it. And it won't always be easy. As a matter of fact, it may be the toughest thing you'll ever do in your life. It does seem perplexing and very serious to that degree, but it is perfectly right. The issue will be more than justly that justify him who has brought you this far. It is a platform for the display of his almighty grace and his power. He will not only deliver you, but in so doing, he will give you a lesson that you will never forget, and to which in many a psalm and song in after days you will revert to and remember all the days of your life, for it will change you forever in eternity as well as in this life that you're living. You will never be able to thank God enough for having done just as he has, for he will have taken you from that which you thought you knew to that which he wanted to do all along, which is to love you. For myself, <laughs> do I regret any of what God has taken me through? No. Did it take a long time to learn the lesson? Oh, yeah. For the longest time, I dealt with the serious aspect of thinking that somehow I was a failure to the Marine Corps, I was a failure to my country, or somehow I was a failure at all. And the truth is, there was absolutely no way I was a failure because, quite frankly, no one could have lived through what the things I went through and survived health-wise as well as mentally and spiritually. And the glorious thing is God did it. I had nothing to do with it. It was amazing to me. And looking back to this day, I still look at it and just, wow, imagine someone going through all that. Because, quite frankly, I went down to like, Oh, I don't know, 89 pounds, maybe 79 pounds. You know, some ridiculous amount for a guy that was my height and weight. I look skinny now, but I've gotten up to like almost 200 once. You know, felt pretty good, 180. Except for I kind of felt like I was fat because I'm not used to that kind of weight. But my point is God chooses and uses whom he wills according to what he does and he alone will take you and make you crooked maybe that no man can make straight because you may not understand the zigzag path that you've gone through in order to get you to where he wants you to be for me it took 30 years because i say about the last five years or about last eight years i guess for me to realize heck i'm not a failure <laughs> i'm god's success story oh i may have known it before but in the back of my mind, you know, you have those little nagging thoughts that Satan kind of plays with. I used to think I was such a failure because I always worked behind the scenes. There was never anything obvious like video for me to do. I was always working for someone else's glory, you know, some pastor somewhere, some ministry somewhere doing something else, and they all got the glory and the honor and the praise, and man, I didn't even get honorable mention. <laughs> so to me, it was always like, eh, you know, 
It's okay, Lord. It's you and me. <laughs> and I would think that would be enough. For some of you, you may say it is. No, it's not. Because you see, every one of us has issues that God is going to gradually crucify until you're hanging on that cross and you just look over and you say, Lord, I don't care anymore. Just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's the fact of where we're all at. We're a bunch of bodies hanging on crosses, just doing the will of God, if you're willing to accept the fact that you're only good as God uses you. Because as soon as God stops using you, no offense, you're not good for anything except to be cast into the lake of fire. But should God use you, ooh, then he's got a plan. Then he has a design and a purpose for you to accomplish according to his will and not your own. But I won't lie to you. It won't be easy. And it's getting a whole lot harder. <laughs>